I see Krentz every once in a while still at meetings. I think he was a very integral person. I think he really believed he was high principles. He really wanted to save things. He still wishes he could have saved things today, but he just wasn't up to it. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. Massive Soviet military forces have invaded the small, non-aligned, sovereign nation of Afghanistan. Poland's military leader, General Jaruzelski, urged the Polish people tonight not to demonstrate on Tuesday, the second anniversary of the founding of the banned trade union, Solidarity. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. We continue the story of Victor Grossman, the U.S. Army soldier who defected to East Germany. He tells us of his life in the GDR, his close friendship with Dean Reed, the Red Elvis, of shortages and his criticism of the regime. He also shares his view on Egon Krentz and details of his first trip back to the United States in the 1990s. Thanks to our select band of supporters who are helping us financially for the price of a cup of coffee a month to cover our increasing costs and keep us on the air. They are the proud owners of a Cold War Conversations coaster. Don't you want one too? If you do, then just head over to patreon.com slash coldwarpod. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash coldwarpod. We welcome back Victor Grossman to Cold War Conversations. Uh, but I was aware in, in, in the building where I live, we knew of two, two men who lived in our in apartments here. Everybody knew that they, that they worked for the Stasi. One of them was a fellow who we never really saw much of. He, was, he, he, really, he wasn't part of the house life because in those days, uh, the 24 families, we all knew each other. We did things together. We cleared the lawns together, etc. He was never a part of it. The other one always was. He was a very friendly fellow. Everybody got along with him. People knew and accepted that he somehow he worked for the Stasi. What he was doing, we didn't know. He didn't ask us questions or anything. And people just took for granted that Stasi was around without worrying too much about it unless they were somehow involved in some activity which, the, uh, which was considered oppositional or, or, or dangerous or somehow um, could represent a threat to the, uh, to the GDR. In that case, whether justifiably or not, they, they, those people who were involved in that were worried. And uh, of course, they were affected. Uh, or people who, were, who tried somehow to cross over into West Germany illegally, they were hit hard too. But for the average person, he went about his average life like, like people in almost any country in the world, or at least like in Britain or in the United States. He went to work for his eight hours. He went home to see TV on the weekend. Perhaps he went to the, to the movies or to the theater or even to opera or to the football, uh, to see football. He uh, went, had a good long vacation in the summertime where he went either to his little his little vill- uh, bungalow. He had some place, uh, half the population had a, a bungalow along a lake or in the woods. Or he went on holiday to the beach or to Bulgaria, to the, to the beaches in Bulgaria or Romania or someplace and lived his life r- r- quite normally. He, it, it, the only thing he didn't like was the, there was a lot of propaganda in radio and television, which was uh, uh, stupid. There were also some very good programs, though, to balance it, so that a lot of people looked at the good programs, and when the, the, the stupid and uh, boring programs came along, they switched to West German TV. Uh, this was a normal life here. Yeah. And did you ever meet Morris Cohen and Lona Cohen, the, uh, the two agents who were in the UK who went to live in East Germany after they were released? I didn't meet them, and right. I didn't meet I didn't meet Klaus Fuchs, you know, for, who was imprisoned in prison in the, in Britain for his uh, for leaking atomic secrets, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, uh, but was... I did meet and got to know the woman who who took the material which he was offering and got it to the Russians. And she did. She was a, a very very interesting woman who worked uh, against the fascists during the war. First against the Japanese fascists, then against the Nazis, and then in Britain helped in this, as she said, to balance the balance the score before the Soviets had the atomic bomb so that there would be equality on that, so that the United States was not on a monopoly position. But when Fuchs was, caught, was cl caught and sent to prison, she managed to get to the GDR where she became a very popular uh, writer. And I got to know her quite well. She's a, a very interesting woman. Um, but I never got to, met, uh, to meet uh, 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 Fuchs himself. Right, right, okay. And I don't know. I don't didn't meet the two people you mentioned. Yeah, no, that that's fine. I was just interested because I know that they did end up. They they were in the UK disguised as they were. They were Americans who were from Brooklyn and were very. I think I've heard of them. I think yeah, I've heard of them, but uh, I didn't know them. Right. Okay. Yeah, when when we get to the 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 nineteen eighties, I mean, did you? Did you have any idea at the time that change was was coming, or was it a, a shock to you? No, definitely. We everybody saw, everybody saw it going downhill. The uh, everybody starting with, well, politically already in the seventies, but economically, say about nineteen eighty two, eighty three. From then on, you could see that the economy was not. Uh, as it had been up till then, moving up and up and up, always with shortages, by the way. The GDR always had, there was always a shortage of some damn thing. Uh, if, if it wasn't mayonnaise, then it was scissors. And if it, <laughs> there's one joke that was commonly told where a man goes to a shop and, says, and, and the shopkeeper says, oh, I'm sorry, sir, you're in the wrong shop. This is where you don't get sneaker shoes. It's next door that you don't get, you can't get any T-shirts. Uh, there was always a shortage, but nevertheless, there was always enough to live quite comfortably and happily, even though you got angry that you that you didn't weren't able to get the thing you wanted to do. Perhaps the most fashionable clothes were difficult to find. Uh, it was hard to keep up with Western fashions, though they they tried, but they could never they could never catch up. But in the 1980s, you could see that things were getting uh, were, were weakening. Uh, I assign this especially to three main reasons. One reason was that electronics had taken over an industry in, in, in much of the world. And the GDR, to compete in, tra in f foreign trade, which was necessary, because it had almost, almost no natural resources of any kind, except poor quality, uh, brown coal, this lignite coal. Otherwise, it had almost nothing, so that it had to trade to get anything, not, uh, both resources and commodities. And it was making some of the best machine tools in the world. But then electronics were, became necessary. You had to uh, run these with electronics, and the GDI did not have that. And the Soviets could not give it either. They they were busy on their own with military and space electronics, they couldn't help. And the West barred any sales of anything to the GDR. As, as, so they, they were all on their own. This little country of 16, 17 million people had to try and build an electronics industry from scratch. That cost billions and billions. As, and that was one reason. The second reason was uh, military. The, the West German military was building at a huge, huge pace with the most modern rockets and weapons of every possible kind, often imported from Lick Lockheed and Grumman and Raytheon, but also made themselves by their, the same companies which made them for Hitler. And the GDR had to try to keep up to a certain extent. It could never compete in that either. It was much, much smaller and weaker. But it had to try to, or it felt anyway, that it had to keep up more or less with that uh, and not rely completely on, on Soviet uh, troops. And the third thing was that the, the had been, it was a terrible housing shortage when I arrived in the 50s. That's, we always had to live in sublet rooms with, with other people who were not so happy about it. 
There was a terrific need for housing, especially because millions came from either East and moved to East Germany from formerly Poland and so forth, what was now Poland. And so there was, a, starting in 1971, Eric Honecker, the head, announced a giant housing program so that by 1990, every family would have a, a, a decent home of its own. In other words, with modern sanitation, with showers and toilets and, and central heating, I think generally, for, mostly general heating, uh, uh, central heating. And this project, which uh, was advanced over the years, also cost billions and billions. I just heard they're now celebrating the anniversary of a huge project in East Berlin, 100,000 homes built in 13 years. Uh, this was wonderful for the people who could move out of these old fashioned, uh, often run down places into these clean new homes. But it, the three, those three elements cost the GDR more than it could afford. Plus many other problems, but those I think were three main problems. And I think this is what b basically broke the back of the GDR economy. And also they were borrowing huge amounts of money from the West as well, weren't they? Which Well, that was part of this because they had to, they had to keep buying iron ore and, and wool and cotton and, and, and veg fruits. And uh, one of the big problems was they could never afford the southern fruits like oranges and bananas. And people were very angry at the shortages of such items. But to buy things and, and uh, including some of the basic, you know, modern industry has to have this constant trade. They were very limited in their trade with the West. And the West, yes, occasionally helped in a way, but the help that they gave was mostly in order to, to uh, attach East German economy to the West German economy so that they were dependent on it. So this had its had its good and its bad sides, but in the long run, it was it was uh, aimed at taking over the GDR, which they then they did did. Yeah, I should say winning over a large number of GDR people. I would say I, I estimated that about fifteen or twenty percent of the GDR population was very very pro GDR all the time, and about fifteen or twenty percent perhaps was very, very anti-GDR, pro-West German <clears throat> also. And uh, all the rest was sort of, uh, they, they changed. They, uh, if, if, they, if a guy got a new guy, a, a, a promotion or a new car, which he'd been waiting for for a long, long time, or some other, uh, a, a, a nice vacation, he tended to be more pro. If he got into trouble somehow, he could, uh, and had some difficulties or other, uh, uh, then he, he would turn against it. Or if he saw, uh, uh, again, he saw a TV set showing a wonderful new Volkswagen or, or, or perhaps a Mercedes or something like that, saying, gee, how wonderful to have something like that. Uh, this, they, they change back and forth in this large middle section. In the beginning, about 82, 83, this middle section, for, for the reasons I've mentioned and other reasons, switched to be anti. And that was what they decided. So that when the vote came in 1990, a really pro-GDR vote was down to 16%. What were your feelings about Gorbachev when he came to power? This was part of the problem because up until Gorbachev became head in the Soviet Union, all the GDR propaganda, I'd say, was the Soviets are our teachers, our helpers, our friends, our allies, but, but, but especially our teachers. Yeah, we learn from them. Now Gorbachev came along, and they couldn't say this anymore because Gorbachev was veering away from the GDR and from the ideas of the GDR leadership. So that the, the relationship became chillier and chillier, especially as Gorbachev or his diplomats began to deal behind the back of the GDR with West Germany in the, in the, in the expectation 
that perhaps Germany would unite and become neutral. Of course, the GDR was against that. It would mean the end of the GDR. So that the tensions rose and Gorbachev became <clears throat> less and less, I would say, um, they would say doctrinaire, the GDR leaders would have said principled. In any case, he pretty well left Eastern Europe and parts of Africa and Latin America. He let them go because the Soviets were also doing, having trouble economically, and he was hoping for help from the West. What it turned out to be was the end of the Soviets. But uh, of course, you couldn't tell that yet. But it meant that the tensions rose between the GDR and the Soviets. And this was very noticeable. So that uh, a lot of people who were so-called dissenters, who were moving up to be anti-GDR in the GDR, they took Gorbachev as their hero. And this was a complicated situation because the GDR never wanted to attack him. At the same time, they didn't want to support him. And so is that politically, there was a very complicated situation here. Um, so when Hanukkah was ousted, what was your feelings about Krentz, Egon Krentz? Uh, so, uh, Krentz. Uh, well, Krentz was our hope, or the hope of people like me who wanted to save the GDR. By the way, during those amazing months between, say, July 1989 and October 1990, things were happening all the time at an immensely rapid pace. And uh, you, things were turning over and over and over. Uh, Hanukkah was forced to quit in October 89. Krenz took over. It was the hope of people like myself who still de definitely wanted to save the GDR. It was a hope that Krenz might be able to pull things together. But as it proved, he wasn't. He, uh, perhaps it would have been impossible anyway, but he was not able to break from this, the way the po political leaders in the GR, they, they never really learned to speak with the people as the people uh, uh, could listen. They were always full of cliches and, and never really came down to brass tacks I think this was one of the big, big problems all along in the GDR, that that people lost trust and confidence in the leadership because they were always uh, stressing the successes and never even mentioning the problems. And of course, people saw the problems every day and they, why aren't they telling this? We thought Krentz might be different. He was a little different, but not enough. And he wasn't simply wasn't a good enough speaker. It adds to it. He was a rather dull speaker as well. And so that you saw that he was not saving the situation in the brief time that was given him. I, I might add something else, however. I see Krentz every once in a while still at meetings and so forth, at, uh, at, at various meetings. I have found, uh, I, I don't know him well, but I just have changed, wor exchanged words occasionally here and then in a greeting scene recognizes me, and of course I recognize him. I think he was a very integral person. I think he really believed he was high principles. He really wanted to save things. He still wishes he could have saved things today, but he just wasn't up to it. That is, the odds were against him so much that even if he had been much better, he probably could not have saved the situation. Uh, but uh, but that's the way it was. He did as be well best he could. It wasn't good enough. But he he stayed a a principal person whom I still admire. The same goes for Hans Modrow, who became the prime minister here in this intermezzo in this in this period in between uh, the end of eighty nine and the uh, and and March nineteen ninety. Yeah. No. I've I've seen a, a long English. Well, a long interview with Krentz, which is quite interesting, uh, but it's got English, it's got English subtitles, so it it it's quite an interesting um, interview. And I think I think you're right. I think circumstances just over. It was too late to try and change anything, and particularly once, you know, the the yes, might it was too late. West he, Germany. He would if he could, but he couldn't. Uh, and uh, uh, the circumstances, and also he was just not 
enough. I might mention, I heard two speeches of him in previous years. One of them, he just rattled off the same baloney that, that, that they all did, these leaders. And one time he gave a speech which was somehow different. It was on the question of war and peace. And he broke with this old vocabulary and he spoke from the heart. And I said, my God, he can really speak. Well, why doesn't he do it all the time? But uh, it, it, he couldn't. Yeah. Yeah. And where where were you when you heard that the, the wall had opened? Um, I must have been at home. <laughs> I must have, it was late at night. I was at home. I had watched on television this announcement by this uh, uh, Shabovsky when he took this paper out of his breast pocket and read it as if he was, was new to him and said, oh, the wall seems to be open. And the journalist said, when? And he said, right now. I saw that on television. I was amazed, of course, like everybody, although I wasn't quite sure that it really would be open. But thousands and tens of thousands of people took him at his word, whether he really meant that immediately or not. They took it that way and flooded the the ex exit uh, uh, stations and just pushed their way out, basically. And uh, for me, this was... Uh, a mixed, very mixed uh, emotion, created very mixed emotions. I might mention that my wife and both sons went the next day, as almost everybody did, to West Berlin. First thing you did was to go to the bank and get this 100, 100 marks of welcome money so you could buy things. I did not go. And of course, as I say, I had mixed feelings because on the one hand, I could see the rejoicement of so many people who could finally get out as they dreamed or hardly dared to dream of and see their relatives and travel, etc., etc. I could see that and I couldn't be, uh, that it couldn't leave me cold. At the same time, I also see it felt this is the beginning of the end, or not quite the beginning, it had been a little sooner, but this is a big step towards the end of the GDR, which, which really made me rather, uh, made me sad. So when did you first cross to the West? Did you, were you, you were still... I waited a few years because right. as long as the U.S. Army was in West Berlin, I still didn't dare to go over. Uh, they left, I think it was 93. And that was the first time my, my, my family went, but I, I went for the first time. But the first time I went just a little bit across the border to one of these cheap um, shops where you could get a, a discount shop with my family to go shopping. Uh, but that was just maybe 100 meters inside the border. But then a little bit later, I was invited to, to the middle of West Berlin to see these buildings, which I had been seeing on TV all the years, these famous buildings, at, et cetera, uh, and all, of the, all the neon lights, which, uh, which was not new to me because I'd known them in the States, but I had been away for 38 years. So that it was really quite... Uh, I wouldn't say positive, I wouldn't say negative. It was just sort of remarkable to see this brightly lit neon commercialized advertising uh, spirit there. And, um, and from then on, however, I went every once in a while whenever, the, whenever there was a reason to go to West Berlin. And uh, so, so what, what happened with your... Um obviously your your desertion from the u.s army did they eventually pardon you or or what happened there what happened was the following in 1989 i wrote to my class of 1949 at harvard telling them my story i might I, I also add that when i came to the gdr to protect my family from difficulties i had changed my name and I had used only this new name all the years. But I broke with that to write to my Harvard class, of course they knew me by my original name, Steve Wexler, and to write where I was and what I was doing. And this was reprinted in the, uh, in the book, this was printed in the class bulletin, but also in the alumni uh, bulletin for all Harvard alumni. And I got uh, 60 or 70 letters and about 10 visits and an invitation to take part in the next class reunion, which was in uh, the end of May, 1989. 
I thought maybe the Harvard name and the invitation came from a person who was very conservative and had a, held a fairly high leading position in the government, not top, but fairly high. I thought maybe this will help me get there without going to prison. And I went to the consulate and asked her what she thought. Uh, I might mention it in the 1970s, they told me I could go to the United States any time and not fear the worst. They said it wouldn't be tough for me there. They could, it, it, it could manage to get me without, without serious consequences. But I hadn't trusted them for various reasons and had forgot, had left, let it go. This time I went with this covered letter in my hand and the consul said, oh, that should, should be possible. Fill out these papers and bring me two photos and I'll write you the documents. When I went back a few days later, she said, you know, I've checked up. I would advise you not to go. The army has a long memory. So she had, she was honest. The others had been lying. She was honest and she advised me against it. So I sort of gave up, but asked a lawyer in Washington, someone helped me find the lawyer, to keep, keep the thing in mind. Five years later, for the next class reunion, I got another invitation. This was 1994. And this time, this lawyer in Washington telephoned me and said, it's okay, you can go now. You won't be, you may be put in prison for one or two nights till they clear it up, but after that you're safe, you'll be okay. And I, against the advice of my brother, who said, you're crazy, do you believe her? I said, yes, it's now or never. So with my wife, I went back to the States in 1994, was released from the US Army after 43 years with no, not even one night in prison, so, uh, some a couple of months later only I got my regular United States passport and have been able to travel back and forth ever since. And and how were you received back in the, in the US? Well, of course, by my relatives with great joy. Uh, not my father, unfortunately. He was no longer alive. Uh, nor was my mother by that time. But at at the class reunion, it was very mixed. Uh, with one single exception, everyone was at least <laughs> at least polite. Nobody was hostile, except this one stupid guy I might mention, but he was the only one, and very briefly, we only crossed our paths for, for, for a few minutes. But, but there were differences. Some were very curious and very friendly. Some were cool, especially men who had fought in Korea, for example, who had been in battle there. Some were cool, some were friendly, but none, none were really hostile, so that I got along very well with them, and I uh, enjoyed it very much, by the way. And mm -hmm. I've gone to every reunion ever since, every five years, and we'll go again in May this time to the 70th reunion. Wow. And wow. none of us under 90. That's amazing. That's amazing. And were any of the, the left-wing group that you mentioned at Harvard uh, there as well? Almost none. Almost none. In fact, only a few who had been sort of on the periphery, the, 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 the close comrades, somehow were not interested in reunions. However, I visited some of them uh, in their various locales and got quite friendly with a few again, uh, renewed our old friendship with several of them. But they somehow were not the kind who liked to go to reunions, so that the reunions were not of that kind. I, I might mention, however, that Harvard has two traditions, one very conservative to reactionary, going back to the, almost to the beginning, but also a, a fairly liberal left-wing tradition, going back to John Reed, who, who um, founded the Communist Party of the United States and wrote a, a famous book about the Russian Revolution. And he was a Harvard man, and they have, his picture is still hanging in one of the uh, dormitories there. Um, so I found uh, I found people of varying sorts, and uh, uh, but those old uh, those old comrades, I met some of them wanted to have nothing to do with me. Some of them were very friendly. Some of them put me up when I visited various their hometowns, and um, uh, so it was mixed. Uh, but as I mentioned before, at least six or seven had become top professors in their fields, which was interesting to me. I had always felt those were among the most brilliant 
dies at Harvard. And have you ever asked to see your Stasi file? Yes, I did also. I, uh, I'm not sure that I got the whole one. Someone tells me there's a lot left, which I would have to go and apply for, and I mean to, but I haven't bothered. But I got stuff from them, too. It, uh, it's not of too great interest. So, uh, it was obvious to me from the start that as an American in the GDR, naturally, they would have an eye on me. You know, they would have an eye on all people from Western countries, not only us, but it was obvious, uh, just as it would be obvious in, 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 in Britain or the United States when a, somebody, <laughs> in, a, in an opposite circumstance, they would keep an eye on them. And I was aware of this. But one person wrote about me that I had, um, he had visited and I had a fluent command of English, German, French, and Russian, which was unfortunately never true. I was fluent in German, though, with a thick accent. French I had at school, and I could sort of get along. Russian, I took two years of it at college, and I could, with, with great attempt, I could sort of understand some of the things I saw in, when I read them, but not much more, so that he was flattering me. Otherwise, th most of what they sent were, were reports saying, this guy is not really helping us at all. We don't, we can't use him. Right. And were, were there anybody in there that you sort of could I? I saw no names of anybody that I knew. Right. I guess wrong, wrong. I'm mistaken. Of the of those men who went to the, the deserters, they were constantly. That was before the war when I was there in the 1950s. Mm. They were constant new ones coming and others leaving. They were disappearing <laughs> illegally, going back to the West. Uh, by the way, it was interesting that those who either brought women or wives with them or met them there, they tended to settle down and get along quite well. It was the ones who came as singles and who didn't find a good partner here uh, as a spouse or whether uh, in, in law, uh, legally or not, they tended not to just so and, and, to, and then to disappear. And, so, and these people who disappeared, whether to the United, whether U.S. Americans or British, were of course always grilled when they returned. Uh, it was part of this grilling that they found out who I really was, my my real name. But also, and they they and they wrote various things about the GDI and the Turkish always uh, about uh, always making it worse than it was for them. <laughs> Uh, I've forgotten the question. Now. Yeah, it was. It was just whether whether you'd identified anybody in your Stasi file. I saw yes, and if, and I saw some of these reports. No, I think they were usually without a name, or maybe always without a name. But in some cases, I could figure out who it was. Right. Like there were two English brothers who came with a huge dog they brought with them—a huge white, lame. I guess it was a shepherd. It was a woolly white dog. And and they they were a little bit nutty, <laughs> both of them. And they returned to Britain and and were interviewed and, and told in a long uh, interview how terribly expensive their their room had been, which was not true. But but by translating the currencies back and forth, they they got it in the wrong currency, so it sounded much much more expensive. And of course, they didn't mention that the that the room rent included taking care of feeding and taking care of their huge dog yeah. which they didn't mention <laughs> so that uh, but that was one funny aspect but otherwise no i think there were no real names mentioned uh, i in the army newspaper published in west germany for the u.s army which i got copies of from a friend i saw that some of these guys uh, were sentenced and got sometimes longer sometimes shorter sentences when they returned Looking back on your experiences, what what would you say is your proudest moment? Oh, that's hard to say. Well, of course, I was always proud when a book got published. And my first book, 1964, I think it was, was a, a children's book with wonderful, wonderful pictures by an artist here. And I was so proud to ha have my first book published. It was a, a little children's book with beautiful pictures and a little story that I had thought up for my son. And I wrote other books and I was proud of them. 
uh, I did an awful lot of lecturing, talking to all kinds of circles all over the country. I traveled to almost every nook and cranny, every city, almost every town and some villages, to factories, to schools, to colleges, to uh, workshops, to apprentices. I spoke to, to all kinds, of, to soldiers. I spoke to every, even jailers. I, I had gave talks always about the United States. That's what they wanted to know about. And of course, I had this American accent, which I never got rid of, which made me credible. And they, they wanted to know about events in the United States. And I met by this, uh, through these travels, as well as also English lessons I gave for scientists over the years. Uh, two week sessions twice a year were very interesting. But through these meetings with these people, first of all, I got a, a, a close picture of thinking as it developed in the GDR over the years, in positively and negatively. Wonder, some wonderful positive stories of many cases of people who had come from the poorest backgrounds imaginable, who would never have had a chance in most countries, but who had become leaders in their field. One of them was a, had come from poor backgrounds, become a genetics uh, professor uh, uh, in, in botanic genetics and remains an expert to, to, until he was pensioned off. And um, but in these talks, I got to, uh, first of all, I, I was very happy if I had a very interesting meeting with, especially with young people, and listened to them, talked to them, was critical, critical, that's why they liked my talks, because I was critical about things I didn't like in the GDR. At the same time, although I was very critical, and they weren't used to hearing lectures, where the lecturer was critical, that was not very common, and they were not used to lectures where the, where the lecturer were told jokes, which I did. And they, of course, that attracted people and got me more lectures. At the same time, I made clear what I believed, that despite all the nasty and all the difficult and all the uh, uh, aspects of the GDR and the blunders and some of the nastiest parts, nevertheless, the goal of the GDR was for an anti-fascist Germany with uh, a happy, decent life for everybody. That was the goal, a socialist goal. I think, although of course, not everybody who in leadership was uh, so imbued with these principles, but a lot of the top people were, uh, as, as well as they could be. So they were limited because of their own past, but that was their goal, an anti-fascist Germany, in, as, as opposed to the one in West Germany, which was built up largely by ex-fascists and ex-Nazis. Uh, as long as they were alive, but uh, an anti-fascist one which threw out all these war criminals, these big weapons companies and pharma companies and uh, and chemical companies who had been part of the war war criminals of the worst possible kind, who had built Auschwitz, who had taken advantage, who had t you misused hundreds of thousands of prisoners and 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 POWs. They had built up West Germany. They were all thrown out of the GDR. This was something I was proud of. I was also proud of the fact that unlike West Germany, the GDR supported the anti-fascists in Spain. It supported Allende in Chile, not Pinochet. It, su it supported the ANC in South Africa and the SWAPO in, in Namibia, the anti-apartheid groups. It supported the North Vietnamese under Ho Chi Minh. It supported poor uh, Nicaragua with a most amazing clinic for poor people, which is the pride of, of all middle Central America to, to this day. These were the things, it trained young people in, southern, in Southwestern Africa in, in trades that they needed to learn. It did these wonderful things which made me proud. And not only that, but it established a society where nobody was in fear of losing their jobs. There was no fear of, of jo joblessness. There was no joblessness. There was always a, a, a need for more. There was always a hard, they were always uh, looking for, the, it was a, a labor shortage. Not only that, there were no evictions. Eviction to evict people from an apartment was illegal. If they didn't pay their rent for two, three years, and stubbornly, 
when they could be removed from that apartment, but not until another cheaper apartment was found for them, so that you never saw a single beggar, you never saw a single people sleeping in the, a single person sleeping in the street. In addition, coming from the United States, which didn't have medical service like in Britain, uh, all medical care was, was you, you know, you went to the doctor, you went to the dentist, you went to the uh, eye doctor, and you got everything. You went to the chemist, you got everything without paying a penny. It was all covered by your one tax. The same was true with education. You didn't pay anything up to, from kindergarten up until graduate college. You didn't pay us, you didn't pay for it. It was all free. And it meant that women could work, and they did. Over 90% worked, uh, far, far more than in West Germany. They had a certain, uh, of course, it was a burden to work and raise a family, but it meant independence and uh, uh, an integrity for millions of women. And all these things made me very proud. And that's why I kept uh, an affection for the GDR. Uh, I would say, despite all its sad and bad parts, an affection which I still keep, and which I've tried to describe, by the way, in a book which is just coming out in a couple of months, in a, a, this time again in English. Most of my books were in German, but this is the second one in English and, and evaluates what I saw and what I felt. I might add one personal note. My mother's last visit to, the, to, to me in, in Berlin, she, she sat there and thought a little and then reflected and said, you know, or who knows, maybe you had it better here than if you had stayed in the United States. Who can tell? Because I must say, I had a, uh, an interesting, but also a, a fairly good life in the GDR. I never really, I, of course, I was angry if I couldn't get mushrooms when I wanted them, or I couldn't get uh, wine glasses when I needed them, or, or something like that, and, but, or apart from my car. But on the whole, I lived a normal and, and very happy, not a, not a wealthy life. I have a little three-room three flat, which is everything I need on the eighth floor. I had these little cars. I, it took a, quite a while to get a telephone, but then I got that too. I had really everything I wanted and uh, was able to send both sons to college uh, for, without paying anything. Uh, I can say I was pretty proud of what the GDR accomplished, accomplished despite Lots and lots and lots of odds against it, both domestic, internal, and from pressures from both East, but especially from the West. What is life like now in the reunified Germany for you? Well, I have it pretty good because uh, uh, shortly after, well, not too long after the the the, the change you call the U turn the Wende it's called in German yeah. uh, of 1990. Uh, shortly thereafter, I got my pension, and because I had been a member of the Writers Association, just as if I had been a member of the uh, work for the post office or the railroad, uh, by paying a certain amount more uh, each month, I got a much better pension. So I have a an adequate pension. Uh, I get along okay on it, although my, my rent just went up again. It, it, it never went up in the GDR days for my apartment. In all, in all those years, it never went up one penny. But since the change, it's been going up, luckily, by small steps. Where the apartments were privatized, they've gone up steeply. But um, still, as I say, I get along personally okay, and I can travel too. But I see around me, first of all, you might say about a third of the people are doing a good deal better than before. About a third of the people are doing more or less, more or less on the same level. Of course, they have lots of commodities they didn't have before, and they can travel, which is very, very nice, and choose any car they want and get any food they want, including a lot of southern fried foods we never even heard of before. Um, but one third of the country, perhaps, is has it worse and is in a tough way, especially single mothers, a large number of pensioners, 
children in, in families that don't get enough, they are having a rough time. And even though, and of course, there's still uh, not so much unemployment in Germany currently, because an awful lot of people have these so-called precarious jobs, which are of limited duration or half time, or come when we want you and, and go when we don't want you. Or if they've been unemployed, they have to take any job that's offered them with even a terribly, terribly low uh, pay and uh, under uh, demean demeaning conditions. A lot of people are considered employed, but have it pretty rough too now. Um, did you ever meet Dean Reed? Oh, uh, it, he, of course, he's unknown in Britain, I think, but he was known by everybody in the GDR as an American actor and singer who came here in the 1970s, early 1970s, and made a terrific, terrific hit here as singer and actor. And I was his close friend. In fact, I was his interpreter for the first two films he made here, so that I was very close to him. He was a very close and dear friend of mine, a very unusual person. He was a real Hollywood showman in, in many ways. You could see it, 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 it you could t t uh, see that real Hollywood showman in many ways, although he wasn't the very best singer or actor. He was fairly good, but he had a, a very charming personality. He was amazingly uh, handsome, and he had, all the same, he had very deep principles. Uh, he believed in socialism all the time, and he never gave up these principles, and we were together in these principles. We, we discussed and argued about lots of things, but these basic belief in a future where people, uh, where working people run the country and not those big bosses in the skyscraper rooms up on top deciding the fate of thousands of people down below, and, and, and those people even further down below sleeping in the street, he, to end this forever for the whole world, that the whole world gets out of this misery. He was devoted to that his entire life, just as I have been. Unfortunately with him, he had all kinds of problems, uh, both personal and also seeing that the GDR was going downhill. Is a disappointment in this. In 1986, he took his life. Uh, committed suicide. Uh, they still debate the why, but I think I've described, the, as I say, partly personal, partly uh, because he was no longer such a hit. He couldn't remain that for too many years. He, he was for, for years, but after uh, he was getting older, and of course, one singer can't, uh, there are very few who can maintain their, their high rate of popularity over many, many, many years so that he saw this coming and all kinds of problems hit him. Uh, he was having trouble with a big, big film project and eventually he took his life. But he was a close friend of mine. And as I say, he was known not only in the GDR, but in Poland, in, in Poland, in Czechoslovakia, and all over the Soviet Union. He, he, for, for the first years, he was a hit with young people there, uh, as they used to say, like Elvis Presley in the West. Yeah, no, no, I, I only discovered his story, um, I think, last year. I wasn't aware of him, and uh, he certainly got the film star looks, anyway. Oh, yes, he was handsome. And in the beginning, I was with him. He had to, uh, I'd, say, I'd see 100 women coming out wanting autographs, and I'd say, gee, Dean, we can get, we can, here's a door, we can get away. He said, no, 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 the, job, the duty of an artist is to oblige his audience, and he'd stay and he'd he'd write a sig give a signature and maybe the word peace for every single one of them. <laughs> he was a, he was an unusual guy in many ways, uh, and as I say, interpreting for him as his, his interpreter in films which were made in part in Romania, in Slovakia in the mountains, in northern Karelia in the middle of the winter, was really a wonderful experience for me. Well, 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 I could I could probably talk even longer with you about Dean Reed, but I've I have taken enough of your time, Victor. I really appreciate the uh, the length of time you've given me, and it's been a really interesting conversation. What's the name of the new book coming out? The new book uh, it was a, it was a 
originally just the work title, working title, but somehow we got stuck with it before it, I could change it. And it is now a socialist defector from Harvard to Karl Marx Allee. Allee is a boulevard in English, in German, and that's where I live. So they're from Harvard to Karl Marx Allee. And I might mention that I am the only person in the world who has a diploma from Harvard and the Karl Marx University. And I'm afraid I'll probably r remain the only person because it's no longer called the Karl Marx University in Leipzig. So, but, but that's the name of the book, and it's coming out in February in English, but of course, first in the States, but can be ordered any place. And I hope, or I hope that some people will buy it, and some people will read it, and some people will like it. It's, it's going to be a pretty controversial book. But uh, as I say, I hope to stir up a little bit of controversy. Well, that's it for today's episode. There's extra in the show notes, including links to Victor Grossman's latest book. The show notes are at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 69. If you like what you're listening, please do leave reviews with iTunes. It really helps us get new guests on the show and increases the profile of the show as well. You can also follow us on Facebook. Just search for Cold War Conversations and we're also on Twitter at Cold War Pod. Thank you very much for listening. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. <laughs>